great to see so many people here tonight who are willing to consider their health and what diet may have a role to play in our overall situation. Most of us recognise that there's something wrong with our health as a society. And I'm going to try and uh, explain to you tonight what I think the role of diet is in that equation. I think it takes a vested interest to uh, uh, develop an ongoing learning path with this. And for some it will be looking at their overall health and for some it will be looking at their weight and seeing what can be benefited from changing diet in that equation. I'm not trying to sell anything at all tonight. This is my take on a huge issue. This is my opinion. I reiterate that this is not individual medical advice. If you have questions, take them up with your own doctor. You've all got a handout starter sheet there. and I encourage you to take that to your doctor, discuss this whole topic with them, and everyone will learn from the whole process. Now we all plan for our financial retirement. We will have financial ideals. We know the benefits of compound interest. Putting a little bit of money away on a regular basis should have benefits that compound over a long period of time. But how many of you are planning your health retirement? I think we're building up our health problems day by day with our diet and our diet related issues. We're chipping away at the ground and digging up a huge hole for ourselves which is going to culminate in poor health for the vast majority of society if we continue the path we're travelling. But tonight's actually about me. We're in a me, me, me society. And these are conclusions that I've drawn from looking around me and looking about what my diet's been. Now I was raised on a diet of sugar, margarine and refined carbohydrates. As a result of that, as a 12 year old, I was 12 stone. I was a fat kid. I am lighter now than I was when I was 12. I'm 75 kilograms now. I had pimples, I was bullied, and for over 40 years, I was careful with my weight. I was dieting as far back as I can remember, and I exercised too hard to try and keep it under control. I was raised on the food pyramid. I think the food pyramid made me sick, and I'm not going to let it continue on that way. That combination, I believe, of sugar, margarine, and polyunsaturated oils, combined with refined carbohydrates, culminated in me having a tumour at the base of my brain around 13 years ago. I required urgent neurosurgery. I had followed up with radiotherapy and chemotherapy and I needed to learn to walk again. With the support of my family, and my friends and colleagues, I was able to return back to a full surgical practice and I'm forever grateful for that. But how did I get into this trouble? Clearly something was related there. And I've spent some years trying to work out, the, work out that equation and I think I've got it worked out now. It's gotten me to thinking. It's gotten me to thinking about a whole lot of issues. It's gotten me to thinking about the rapid increase in modern disease across the world and the changing spectrum that we see. I think all of it's related to diet. It got me thinking about the increasing problems of obesity in society. I think that's related to our diet. Why do skinny people still get dementia, heart attacks and cancer? You heard of the term toffees? Thin outside, fat inside. We think that most people who are obese are actually unwell and about 80% of them are metabolically unwell. But if you actually look at the thins, the thin ones, the, the toffees, about 40% of them are metabolically unwell. Thin people get diabetes, thin people get heart attacks, thin people get strokes. I think that's related to diet. How many of you have tried dietary fads over the years, one after another? And when you fail that, you feel guilty. More importantly, you're actually told that you're guilty. So how did the world get into this trouble? I think if we'd let this go on for much longer, we're in a bigger problem than we already are at the moment. So I think I've got it worked out. I think that the combination of sugar, and particularly fructose, 
I think, polyunsaturated oils and refined carbohydrates in the amount that we have in today's society, and I'll stress that again, the amount, is toxic and we're all suffering from it. I think the food pyramid is making us sicker. I'm very much looking forward to a book being put out by Denise Minger in January 1, 2014. Um, who really researches the food pyramid. And I've read her blog on and off for quite some time. And I'm looking forward to that book. It's called Death by Food Pyramid. And I haven't even read it, but if you can get hold of it, I think it's going to be a great read. So I did medicine. How much nutritional education did I get? I can't remember one bit. Mind you, I missed out on a bit. A few went down the beach a few times. I got taught a little bit about deficiencies, vitamin C deficiency, vitamin D deficiency. I can't remember a single lecture about excesses. And the trouble now is that most of our education that comes our way is often industry sponsored. The other reps who come along and bring the morning tea. Um, you'd be glad to hear that most of the morning teas that come to the LGH when I'm around have involved cake no more, sweets no more. Uh, quite like when they bring bacon and egg muffins. And uh, so I'm still sponsored by industry, but they're actually not bring, they're bringing along fructose-free. Doctors on the whole have, are busy. They're busy because they've time constraints, and I don't think they actually read enough. And when they do read, they tend to believe the guidelines that are handed out by things like the Australian Dietitians Association. Uh, the Heart Foundation, who some of you who follow me on Facebook know that I have some qualms with. And, um, and um, just tend to ignore the fads as they come along. How do doctors think? Most of the times, if you've been to the doctor, you come along with a problem, the doctor takes a history, listens to you, examines you, and then compartmentalises you, tries to put you into a box and sort you out, do what he needs to do. And, and if you don't fit in the box, that sort of, then we try and squeeze you into a box. But not many doctors actually think outside of the box. And maybe that's one of my troubles. I think medicine and doctors are incredibly reactive. They come along with a series of problems and then we react to it. We think, OK, he's got a broken leg, I'll fix it. Didn't actually think, why did he break his leg? Someone's got high blood pressure, let's treat the high blood pressure, not why did they have high blood pressure. So medicine focuses on the disease rather than the cause. I'd like to be proactive. I'd like us to go back to the start rather than the finish because they're actually totally and utterly interrelated. If we go back to the start, we've got to look at history. We have evolved. We were, were you know, apish and hunter-gatherers. We've evolved to be the dominant force at the top of the food pyramid. I suspect most of us would fail to survive if we had to go back into the wild now. And I don't think we've learned to live the proper way. Now, for two and a half million years, we've evolved as hunter-gatherers. And in that time, we managed to get to the top of that food, uh, food pyramid. And we ran that on a hybrid engine. All right? We had two fuel sources as hunter-gatherers. One was a summer fuel of sugar and carbohydrate and a winter fuel of fat. Now, we run on that summer fuel of carbohydrate and sugar all the time. We don't run on fat, and I'd argue that there's probably no one in this room here who's actually run a single day, let alone a month or six months, on a fuel of fat. But there's some really interesting research called ketogenic diets associated with type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and cancer management, and those people are actually running on a ketogenic winter fuel diet of fat. Cells will metabolise both, but we've just forgotten how to... We haven't forgotten. We can turn it back on. It takes a little bit of time to switch tanks. So what was... What are the food... Oh, sorry. Hunter-gatherer food sources. They ate local, obviously. They ate seasonal, and there was food... There was fruit in summer. And it was natural. There was no processing. Sounds pretty obvious for two and a half million years before Coles and Woolies came along. So we had hunter-gatherer, they had food sources, OK? Seasonal fruit, which is something you hear me go on about. We are completely and utterly wired to get hold of seasonal fruit, find that local fruit tree, because we know it's, we, everything we know is sweet is good. Find that fruit tree, turn it, uh, uh, find the tree, sit underneath the tree, wait for the fruit to ripen, gorge upon it, stuff our faces because it makes us hungry, and then after it's made us hungry, we turn that into fat for winter hibernation. It's elegant. It's magnificent. 
at the same time we're fighting the birds and the insects and the possums. Uh, and they're all there at the same time. As we approach into our summer season, some of you are putting netting over the grapes and all that sort of thing. Well, we didn't have netting as hunter-gatherers. We had to scare them off. Honey is seasonal as well. There's nothing natural about having honey in your pantry. Right? It's normally made for a few weeks of summer when the, bird, uh, when the uh, flowers are out, the, the pollen's collected, and then it's actually stored in a thing called a beehive, normally in an inaccessible place up a tree, stuck in wax, then guarded by bees. And somehow that we've decided taking honey out of the beehive is really natural, and then we can spread it on everything and consider it to be natural. Sorry, I'm just into the marketing of the world. Everything's natural at the moment. It's quite natural for me to be standing up here. If we could catch animals who were stupid enough to fall into some form of trap or we could run faster than them, we'd eat them. We used to eat a few witchetty grubs in our time. We were raised on breast milk, right? Lactose intolerance wasn't around as a hunter-gatherer. If it was, that person didn't survive. Ate our root vegetables, ate our nuts when we could forage for them, and eggs, if we could catch them in the nest, were another um, source of food. So about 10,000 years ago we started farming, we domesticated our animals, we started cropping um, wheat and the like, and we ate full fibre grains. In the industrial age came along, the last few hundred years we just started looking at mechanisation and we started becoming efficient. And now we're in the modern age, which is all about convenience. We're into mass production, we're into driving costs of food production down, and it's all about profit. This is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. So when did we switch into convenience? I think it was the 1950s. Fast food started taking a hold, cars got, came along. Uh, in the modern form, uh, eating out became a much more of a, like, a simple uh, and easily affordable item. In the same time frame, we recognise that money makes the world go round. The food industry and ourselves, by our demands for convenience, started introducing sugar. They started removing fibre from food. And there were de genuine cost savings for the introduction of polyunsaturated seed oils that could be cropped. We know sugar is a great preservative. Have you ever seen sugar go mouldy in the pantry? It just doesn't, does it? You know, honey is still found from uh, uh, Egyptian tombs, uh, and it's still there. I don't think it tastes quite the same, but it hasn't gone off. We took the fibre out of grains. That improved shelf life and therefore profitability. You know that a grain bread goes mouldy. You know the seedy grain bread goes mouldy within a week, whereas the white loaf is still OK at day 10 because you've taken the fibre out and they've put a bit more sugar in it. Then you get the raisin bread, OK? Still OK three or four weeks down the track because it's got more sugar in it. And you're all going to have, you may have some Christmas pudding this year, but you can probably still have that next Christmas because it's full of fruit, full of sugar, and we've cut the fibre down. We introduced polyunsaturated oils. They could be cropped. It's infinitely cheaper to crop a field of um, canola. Uh, well, it's actually not canola. Do you know what the, uh, the, the base seed of uh, canola is? Rape seed. OK, it's not really marketable, is it? Slightly politically incorrect, but you'll get used to me. I think that polyunsaturated oils account for inflammation. I don't think that our natural food is natural. I think it's entirely manufactured now. The amount of chemicals that go into uh, the food manufacture, the manipulation of genetics, fruit now has got more sugar in it and less fibre, improved shelf life. I think the apple's rotten. And with all that manufactured food, we started to get into trouble. We've got increasing health costs, and that's not just now, that's into the future. It's well and truly predictable. I've looked at the economic cost of uh, looking after well diabetics, did a paper about three years ago. And if we look at that population in Australia, that we will spend the entire, this is looking at well diabetics, no problems, no ulcers, no heart attacks, no strokes. This is just going to the doctor for your medication, review, having an eye test, a bit of podiatry. We will spend the entire Australian health budget looking after well diabetics within 20 years. 
and now I was criticised of that paper at a couple of meetings because they said I was being dramatic. And I said, no, I'm not being dramatic because I modelled it on 40% of the expected number of diabetics. You can get those figures from Access Economics. It's a simple fact. We're going bankrupt. We cannot afford our health. And I presume that's why some of you are here tonight, because you might be seeing the, that end of the tunnel like I can. So let's look at those things. Sugar, fibre, polyunsaturated oils a bit further. Now, sugar's sugar. It doesn't matter what sort of sugar it is, brown sugar, white sugar. Um, uh, what are the other ones? Molasses, uh, icing sugar. It's all sucrose. It's 50% glucose, 50% fructose. But I quite like looking at history. I like to see when sugar started causing troubles for us. The sugar originally started from a plant uh, grown in the New Guinea Highlands. Uh, the sweetness was extracted from it, went across Asia, made it to Europe, and Europe thought it was a luxury item. Um, now they can't grow it particularly well in Europe or not for the sugar cane at that point in time, so they worked out they could grow it in the West Indies and in the south of the United States. It wasn't the United States back then. But you needed cheap labour to do that. So Europe and particularly Britain were quite good at sending manufacturing goods. Uh, from Europe down to the west coast of Africa and they tended to trade them for a few slaves, sent them across into the West Indies and then that was all traded back as sugar, tobacco and cotton. And hasn't that created a few social implications around the world, that slavery over time? So what was our sugar consumption in the past? Well, in about 1800 it was calculated to be about a teaspoon per day, one to two kilos per annum. 1900, it was about six, te six teaspoons per day. And in 2010, we're up to about 40 teaspoons per day. And most of that's hidden. Most of that's hidden. Now, you may not think that you have 40 teaspoons per day, but I watched my nephew consume uh, 80 teaspoons as a toffee, skinny kid. And I went, you've got to be kidding. So he's making up for me. So we look at fructose consumption. And this is a graph that the sugar industry um, tend to point out. They point out the blue line one, and David Gillespie's sent this on to me. Uh, the blue line says that we've, in the United States we've had less sugar consumption than ever. And they point to the fact that sugar is actually not implicated in modern disease. But if you actually look at the overall amount with the introduction of high fructose corn syrup and also that of, uh, related to uh, uh, juices, which is the grey textured area, our sugar consumption has actually gone up significantly, and particularly the fructose component. The Australian figures are very, very similar. Let's look at dietary fats. Saturated fats generally tend to come from animals. Monounsaturated fats tend to be from fruits and nuts. And uh, plants tend to give us polyunsaturated oils. Let's look at the added dietary fats in the United States. Uh, You'll see that over the last 100 years that the yellow line is related to our butter, the red line related to our lard. We've actually decreased the amount of saturated fat we've had in our diet. Margarine's the green line, which went up for a little bit in the 1950s, and it's drifted back down again. But vegetable oils have gone up dramatically. There's no such thing as a vegetable oil, by the way. Vegetables don't create oil. It just happens to be a nice little name that makes seed oils um, sound a little bit better because we're quite like the term fruit and veggies, but we don't actually like rapeseed as a term. So somehow or other the food industry has made us convinced that vegetable oils is the term to go with. That consumption, the green line's our overall fat consumption, but the proportion now is so much higher if we compare it to... Back here, back here around 100 years ago, we used to have a very small amount of polyunsaturated intake, a much higher of it, and in comparison with our saturated fat intake. I'll come back to that omega-6, omega-3 uh, ratio a little bit later. But predominantly, our fat intake now is polyunsaturated. So in about 1800, we had about 6 grams per annum. It doesn't sound like much. 6 grams, 1.5 teaspoons per annum, so it's not per day. 1900, about nine grams. 2013, it's estimated we happened about 45 grams. And this is hidden stuff. You look at the packaging that you actually have when processed food comes in a packet, 90% of it's gonna have polyunsaturated oils of some type in it. 
Stefan Gernett, uh, an interesting guy, he's actually been looking at data which I didn't even know existed. And he's been looking at data from the 1950s, looking at linoleic acid. Now you see that figure there, that line looks very similar to the line of polyunsaturated fats that we consume. Someone, and I've asked him this, like, why did people start biopsying fat and looking at the amount of fat, the, very, the, the amounts of fat in fat? And what he has found that in 1960, 8% of the fat in our bodies was polyunsaturated fat, 8%. 2010, it's 24%. That's been a steady increase. We've had a 300% increase in the amount of polyunsaturated fat in our bodies, in our fat. It's not just what's actually in our fat. This is the same graph with breast milk. So what mothers are feeding their babies is more and more full of omega-6 linoleic acid, pro-inflammatory fat. Whereas alpha-linic acid, which is omega-3, has re remained relatively unchanged. That's the safe fatty acid. That's the safe polyunsaturated one. But the dangerous one, the omega-6 component, has gone up and up and up. Those figures, that graph's completely different if you happen to be an African woman. It's going up again now, apparently. But the, that ratio has actually stayed down in, on a population that has not been exposed to the modern diet. Now, if you get confused between linoleic acid and alpha-linolenic acid, don't get fussed about it. If you actually go to the, um, the um, uh, Seed Oil Association webpage, now that's the leading body for Australia that recognises the entire industry, they've actually got it the wrong way around. Now, I've read that ten times because I, could, I just didn't want to actually accuse them. And, and I've taken a screenshot in case they ever do it. But even the Oil Association can't get their own figures right. So don't get too fussed if you get mixed up on graphs. What's happened to meat consumption in Australia? Now, the Heart Foundation blame you know, all of our heart disease on uh, saturated fats and we've got to stay away from them. But over the last 50 years, looking at the green graph, which is related to lamb and mutton, the beef, the orange one and the grey one, which is pork, they've stayed very, very low. Now, chickens have gone up. We've taken a lot more chicken, and that's a lean meat. We all talk it's very good. And, you know, we eat a lot of chicken in our house. But what I've come to recognise is that if you actually get chicken and you feed it grain, its omega-6 level is a lot higher than that of a pasture-fed chook or a free-range chook. And the same thing goes with pork, cattle, uh, sheep never really eat grain, uh, and fish. So salmon farms where they feed them grain have got a higher omega-6 level to those that are wild. Uh, it's still very low, and I'll still say eat your meat, eat your fish, but just be aware that if you've got a choice and you've got an option, and in Tasmania we're very lucky, there is no grain-fed beef here, or sheep, or it's virtually all free-range. So it's a good argument to stick with free-range. What's happened with our fast food consumption? Well, not surprisingly, it's gone up a little bit. 2011, we spent $6.2 billion on lollies and chocolate in Australia. It's all right, we only spent $3.5 billion on soft drink. And we spent more than $37 billion on takeaway food. So there's a few people with vested interests out there who don't like me. I'm talking about putting the little shop owner out of business on the corner store. You know, the magazine seller on the corner store in, in, uh, in Melbourne who's always selling magazines which are actually being put out by the iPad and I've got something here which will put him out of business. I can look at magazines online. Um, and the only other stuff he sells is that, uh, that junk food. So he's in strife. He doesn't like me either. So. Let's look at what guidelines we've had in society over the last um, 100 years. They've been around for a long time. Nutrition guidelines are, are medical advice on how to eat, how to live your life. William Harvey, in 1862, introduced the Banting diet. And he observed that sweet and starchy diets were used to fatten animals. That's what we still do with feedlots. You know that grain-fed beef is more expensive than that of pasture? You seen that? Well, bring it on, OK. <laughs> I'll go and eat the grain, I'll eat the past one. Anyway, William Harvey observed that when he restricted sweet and starchy foods, his patients lost 
with uh, lost their weight with effortless effortless success with no more than a few ounces of fruit or stale toast per day. Carbohydrate restriction was around in managing obesity in 1862. Careful to pick up the water here and not the lemonade. William Osler, father of medicine in 1901, described that obese women should avoid taking up too much food and particularly the starches and sugar. Now, little plug here, 1923, Nobel Prize for Medicine went to Dr. Frederick Banting for his discovery of insulin and the isolation of it from uh, the uh, pancreas from rabbits. Do you know what his other claim to fame was? I don't know, this is great trivia, I only found this out last week, because he was an orthopaedic surgeon. <laughs> so I am not the first orthopaedic surgeon to dabble in endocrinology. I got a hold of this book uh, recently by Raymond Green. There are only two copies of it left in the world. 1948, textbook of the practice of endocrinology, the treatment of obesity. Okay, 1948, foods to be avoided, bread, cereals, potatoes, foods containing sugar, all sweets. You can eat as much as you like of the following foods, meat, fish, birds, green vegetables, eggs, cheese, fruit, except bananas and grapes. I'm not telling you anything new tonight, okay? There's nothing new. I have not reinvented the wheel. So we had for about 30 or 40 years, quite a big debate going, fat versus sugar, which one's the baddie? Went on between Ansel Keys and John Yudkin. Ansel Keys, quite a famous American. Um, he was a US physiologist. He was the guy who came up with K-rations, K rations, which is the basic food for US Army. And he worked out uh, what was the minimum amount of food you needed to actually survive. And uh, as a result of that, he uh, did a lot of work with the US uh, government. And he was commissioned to look into the problems of an increasing rate of cardiovascular disease. And he did that um, and looked at nutritional uh, profiles of people from 22 countries. Ultimately, he published his paper called Seven Countries. And I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, but his conclusion at that time was that if you had a diet high in saturated fat, you had a higher rate of cardiovascular disease. End of topic. And um, then the US food industry latched onto it and decided that saturated fats were bad and uh, we should introduce uh, corn syrup and off we went. However, when you look back at his data, if you take into other countries, the other, 20, other 15 countries, you take into a country like Mexico, which is right next door to the United States, which has a diet very high in saturated fats but had a very low rate of cardiovascular disease, something was suspicious. Didn't fit his model, didn't fit the hypothesis, so it went out with, didn't get included in the seven countries. The difference between Mexico and the United States at that point in time was that Mexico had a diet very low in sugar and the US had one that was high in sugar. So he had all the data, he just made the wrong conclusion. I'm being told, aren't I? <laughs> John Yudkin published a book in 1972, Pure, White and Deadly, and he was diametrically opposite to, to Ansel Keys. He said that if you feed rats fat, they don't get fat. And if you feed rats sugar, they get fat, they get metabolic syndrome, they get obesity, they get cardiovascular disease. Very simple. He published, he tried to debate Keyes, publicly denounced, denounced in the US. And any Yudkinites that travelled to the United States didn't get jobs. So in the 1970s, the fat and sugar debate was won by Ansel Keyes. But here we are, 2013, and both of these guys are dead, but look who's smiling now. I've got a copy of Yudkin's book, but I haven't bothered getting a copy of anything of Keyes, by the way. So the food pyramids have been around for a while. They were first invented in Sweden in the 1970s. The United States actually looked at food pyramids as early as 1980 and started trying to develop it. And if you actually read some stuff from the people, the nutritionists that were involved in the food pyramid process in the 1980s, they essentially wanted three to four servings maximum of bread, cereal, rice and pasta. They were lobbied and lobbied and lobbied by the American food industry and it was moved up to six to 11, which is the food pyramid that we know today. So it was not what was originally advised, but it was lobbied to look like it is at the moment. 
So since then we worshipped the food pyramid we all raised on it. Our teachers told us it was the way to go and they couldn't possibly be wrong. My concern is that science was made to fit the puzzle. And a paper I gave in Melbourne last week was about the flawed nutritional science. And I, I'm not, you know, in summary, we made the science fit the puzzle. Now, just drifting to sugar just for a second. Sugar is sucrose. It's half glucose, half fructose. Fructose and glucose look incredibly similar, except they're just a couple of chains switched around on them. Same number of molecules. They're metabolised completely differently. Now, we know truckloads about glucose. I've got a textbook of biochemistry, which I dragged out again recently. Everything about glucose. There's about half a paragraph on fructose, and all it said is, oh, we give a phosphate off into this thing called the Krebs cycle, and it's involved in energy production. Nobody really looked at what happened to fructose after we gave that particle until Look Tappy in 2010, that's three years ago, published this article in Physiological Reviews. It was a definitive review on what fructose does after it gives off that one phosphate. It's a landmark article, if you ever get a chance to read it, it's on my website, it's down there somewhere. But it makes me question all nutritional science. So if we've ignored what fructose does, and we only found out about it three years ago, I think everything before that's actually flawed. Nutritional science is complex. It either involves human studies, animal studies. It's prone to human error. OK, who, um, who knows what they had for breakfast yesterday morning? Well, most of us know pretty well. OK, let's say you put some milk with it. Did you put 200 mils of milk or did you put 250 mils of milk with it? All right, that 50 mils is a 25% error rate in, statis in statistics. Did you have a handful of peanuts yesterday? Did you have eight or did you have 10? Did you have 12? Did you have 16? I can't remember how many. And if you actually did count and you're involved in a nutritional study, you're totally and to totally obsessed. And I wouldn't trust anything you say anyway because anybody who calculates it that much is even more obsessive than me. Animal studies are not human studies, but they have less variables, far more controlled environments. And rats, in fact, have a very similar metabolism to humans, except for one variable. They have a thing called uricase. You've heard of uric acid, and I'll come on to it later. It's pretty important. And I'm sorry tonight, it's a bit about biochemistry, the first half, because you've got to know where we've come from to work out where we're going. The thing about uric acid, it's a metabolite of fructose metabolism. It's a waste product and it builds up in the system. And rats have got this thing called uricase to get rid of it. So if you do a rat experiment, you need to increase the amount of fructose threefold to get the same effect as a human. Everything's about, still the metabolism's right, but you need to have threefold increase in, uric uh, in fructose. What that means is that big sugar, when they come out and debate this topic, as it was in Sydney on Monday, they throw up a smoke screen and say, look, it's not relevant because the doses of fructose and sugar that you use in rat experiments are higher than what humans have. But, and they're not using non-human dosages, so forget any relevance from that. However, there's some articles coming out at the moment which are using normal human doses, you know, the amounts that my nephew's having, and it's showing the same stuff. Funding for uh, nutritional science is... Uh, pretty well in industry driven. There is not a lot of money for people to go along and do expensive drawn out studies. It just doesn't exist. So that immediately becomes biased. So nutritional science leaves me bewildered. Most of the stuff that I've got together in my head now, I've looked at laboratory stuff and some people will say that I've cherry picked, but nonetheless, this is my take on it. This is my opinion. I don't think nutritional science has helped modern disease. I think we're getting sicker and sicker with a wide range of complex issues. Now, I'm going to keep it pretty simple. Albert Einstein said, if you cannot explain it simply, then you do not understand it well enough. So I think I try and understand it well enough, but I am an orthopaedic surgeon, so humour me, because my idea of biochemistry is that you stick milk in your mouth and that makes calcium and it makes your bones stronger. Um, so I'm going to use lots of pictures to try and explain what I think metabolism is of fructose and try and explain it to you all. Modern disease equals inflammation. Every organ in the body is inflamed at the moment. That's the common denominator. So where's the inflammation? 
That inflammation is in the arterial walls of every blood vessel in every organ of the body. So what's the fuel that makes that inflammation that sits in that blood vessel space? Back to that figure. Fructose, polyunsaturated oils and refined carbohydrates. It's a pretty picture of a mitochondrium. That's a, um, uh, that's a cellular power plant within a cell and it generates most of the cell's chemical energy. It's a hybrid engine. It can run on glucose or it can run on fat. So hunter-gatherers went through long winters and they ran on fat, and fat's actually incredibly efficient fuel. It's very dense. We were told if you eat lots of fat, be wary, because it's got lots of calories with it. But it's very energy dense, it's very, uh, very efficient. But today we're actually going to dwell more on the sugar component because that's what we pretty well all run on. Again, sugar, half glucose, half fructose. Here's a little secret. I'll, I'll summarise Look Tappy's paper, or at least half of it. Fructose makes low-density lipoproteins, LDLs. You've heard, most of you heard about LDLs, they're the baddies. HDLs are the goodies. That's what happens after fructose gives off that particle for energy. It goes off as part of the storage mechanism. Gets absorbed by the gut. Got an incredibly efficient system there. If we're in starvation, there are not many GLUT2 receptors. There are five sorts of them, but I'll send it GLUT2. Those GLUT2 receptors sit there just waiting away. The moment fruit comes in season, the number of receptors in your gut goes up, and within two days, it's maxed out. And it can actually keep absorbing more and more and more fruit, or fructose, and crossing the, the gut barrier. And then after the fruit season, those receptors die down again. But again, 12 months later, up they go again. That fructose is taken to the liver and then it goes through a metabolic cycle. Now the big brown thing there is the liver. Lots of complex metabolic pathways. I'm going to add in a few pictures and try and make it easier for me and hopefully for you. So we're going to put a bit of sugar into the equation. Comes in up the top here, half is fructose and a little bit of it goes out the top end there towards glucose production, glycogen, and that's an immediate energy source. The trouble is we never have fructose by itself. It always comes with glucose in sugar. So glucose is the preferred pathway. The liver doesn't have to do anything to it. Off it goes, uses it up as energy, goes straight to glycogen storage. So virtually nothing in our normal diet goes out as glycogen. What it does do, take fructose in, out it zips down the bottom right there towards LDL production. Now there's a couple of other pictures I can put in there, but that's it, essentially. Forms very low density lipoproteins, they circulate around, come out as LDLs. Now what happens if you actually want to make some wine? You get grapes, you ferment them, and you make it into wine, don't you? And the component in the grapes that you make into wine is fructose. So what do you think the liver does with it? Ferments half of it, has a glutaraldehyde pathway and produces alcohol in the liver. And if you have too much alcohol in your liver, then you get cirrhosis. All right, welcome to the modern day cause of cirrhosis. It's not alcohol, it's sugar. So, there's a little line there. Out the side comes free fatty acids in the production. They promote insulin response. Insulin's all about laying down fat and storage. Now, the favourite bit of this, uric acid, come back to it over and over again. Uric acid comes out as a waste product out of the liver, and we know about uric acid, it's called gout. We also know that if you have too much uric acid, you get high blood pressure, heart disease, and uh, it's a major uh, problem. The other thing we don't really know about uric, or we've only just found out about uric acid, is what its effect is on a thing called nitric oxide. Some of you in medicine may have heard about that. And here's my simplistic diagram with nitric oxide. There are three forms of nitric oxidase. Nitric oxide is this, that blue and red, you know, bubbly thing to the left. This is the way an orthopaedic surgeon does biochemistry, by the way. Okay, I didn't do that well at university. It's quite interesting how I learn it as a, a couple of decades down the track. Nitric oxide maintains the blood supply to the brain. It's a vasodilator. It allows us to keep our brains alive when everything else goes sour. You know, if you're in shock, the last thing that loses blood supply is your brain. Welcome to nitric oxide. Are you interested in it now? It's your survival mechanism. 
The second bit of it, there's another form which actually goes around and makes our veins, and also it makes our arteries dilate, it maintains circulation to organs. So those organs that need more blood supply, like the heart and the kidneys, have more nitric oxide around. And it's also another form allows our immune system to work, allows our white cells to get around and do their stuff. So if you inhibit nitric oxide by having too much uric acid around, you get less blood supply to your brain, and that's implicated in the cause of dementia and mental health. If you don't let your, vein, your arteries dilate because there's too much uric acid around and not enough nitric oxide, you get hypertension. And if you don't let your white cells do their job, you get poor immunity, higher infection, and a possible role in cancer cell proliferation. So if you get too much fructose, in it goes the top end. A little bit goes to glycogen, a bit of energy, but you know, very little. A fair amount goes to wine production down the bottom, so you get alcohol, alcoholic problems in the liver. A whole lot of it goes off as uric acid out the top end there to give some heart, heart issues. But down the bottom, out it comes as low-density lipoproteins and lots of it. Now those lipoproteins, they're LDLs, they need fat in them. That's what they are. They transport fat around the bodies. They actually don't care what sort of fat they take in. They take it in purely related to how much, how much we ingest. And here we come to saturated fats and polyunsaturated fats. Saturated fats are butter. It's got a very rigid structure. That's it on the left there. It's solid as a rock. Whereas polyunsaturated fats have got lots of flexibility, lots of double bonds in them. So animal fats, saturated fats, are solid at room temperature and they're liquid at 37 degrees as we're all standing around. That's our body temperature. A polyunsaturated fat comes from a seed oil and, poly and seeds and plants need to actually survive at very low temperatures, you know, winter days here. They need to transport nutrients up and down. So they do that by having these really flexible polyunsaturated oils within them. What that means is every point that creates flexibility is done at a thing called a double bond. That's how things link up. And the more double bonds you've got, the more flexible it is. As I get older, I think I'm getting stiff. I don't have enough flexibility, but it's not double bonds. So all those double bonds that are sitting there are all points of weakness. They're all points of, therefore, oxidation. Oxidation equals rust. That equals inflammation. We all know the difference between stainless steel. I like to think about stainless steel. That is like a saturated fat, whereas um, polyunsaturated fats are like that uh, cast iron uh, bit of steel which sticks out in the weather and then rusts. We come back to the omega-3 versus the omega-6 fatty acids. I promise you the second half of the evening will get a bit more interesting. Omega-3 uh, fatty acids, which predominantly most of those blue ones, are safe, they're not a problem. But that pink one, the omega-6, gets metabolised down there. And that's the inflammatory one. So those LDLs, they don't care whether or not they're filled up with butter, with a saturated fat or a polyunsaturated fat. I digress just a little bit. Our cell membranes, our walls of our cells, are actually made up of fat. And here we are, most of the fat in them is a saturated fat at the moment. But as time goes on, those cells, walls, have the same ability to decide whether or not they want a saturated fat or, or unsaturated fat. So LDLs and membrane walls don't care whether or not it's saturated or unsaturated. I come back to Stefan Gianek's chart there again. As time goes on, we've made a decision to increase the amount of polyunsaturated fat in our fat by 300%. So if we fill our bodies up with saturated oils, solid as a brick wall, right? welcome to the, like the three little piggies, that's going to stand there for a long time. But if we decide to fill up with polyunsaturated fats, then we're filling up our cell walls and our LDLs with kindling, the highly flammable, most likely to rust, and it becomes inflamed. Where does that inflammation sit? Well, it sits in the blood vessel wall. Juan Gill from Barcelona has loaned me this, uh, well not loaned, he's given it to me this picture. I think it means a lot in the explanation. I'll spend just a second or two on it. This is the blood vessel and the blood vessel wall. In the yellow, 
we've got the blood vessel wall, and in it we've got the circulating low density lipoproteins. They are the Goldilocks. They're just the right size. They're not too small, not too big. What they do is they sneak in to the blood vessel wall. Once they're in that blood vessel wall, they're trapped there. The very low density lipoproteins, they race on by, they're big fluffy things. They don't get caught. The high, high density lipoproteins, little ones which soak up extra lipids around the body, they zip in and out. But the LDLs, they get stuck there. Goldilocks is stuck. When it sits in there, it's got a choice of, it then gets oxidised, and the more polyunsaturated fat that's in there, the more oxidation that occurs at this point there. And the moment you get that, you end up with more inflammation. Welcome to modern disease. That's the model for atherosclerosis. That's what we've got nowadays. So we've got subintimal, that's the term, subintimal inflammation in every blood vessel, in every organ of the body. And it's LDLs, and those LDLs have gotten there because of fructose, and we've decided to fill them up with polyunsaturated seed oils. I talk about refined carbohydrates. Everyone loves carbs, and we'll try and demyth that a little bit later. Starches, whether or not they're bread, rice, pasta, cereal, potatoes, or glucose, or maltose, or dextrose, or lactose, are all just molecules of glucose. That's all. The other carbohydrates around called fructose looks very similar to glucose. It's metabolised quite differently into the LDLs. So if you have too much glucose in the form of refined carbohydrates, you get an insulin response. Insulin makes you lay down fat. It's involved in the growth, hormone, uh, in the, uh, growth of tumours. So here we are, we get obese. So simple picture. Fructose creates the LDLs. Polyunsaturated fats create infl in, uh, an inflammatory product and together they make inflammation. Add in refined carbohydrates, glucose effect, get a big insulin effect, makes the whole lot a lot angrier and gives us obesity and a whole raft of diseases. So this is my lipid profile. This is the first lipid subfraction analysis done in Tasmania. It's only done this year. It's available to you all. It's about $150, which is about two to three months' cost of statins, but that's another topic. We can talk about those in question time at the end if you want. I have no bad LDLs in the system. I've got some in the yellow, that yellow line that's type 1, a few in type 2, and the bad ones are 4, 5, 6 and 7. I have zero LDLs. I've had my cancer in the past. I'm chasing it down. I want no bad LDLs. My HDLs are way up. That's what you all want as your lipid profile. That's just called bragging, OK? But that's the product of me actually being on this process for two years. I didn't know what they were beforehand, but I do know what they are now. So modern disease is inflammation. It's inflammation and everything. I'm going to zip through a few organs reasonably quickly in the passage of time and give you an idea of how we're going. Inflammation in the brain, huge topic. There are numerous implications for the brain. I've talked about dementia. Dementia is increasing. It's well and truly associated with diabetes, well and truly associated with obesity, very strong linkages there. There's an increasing rate of autism, okay, children affected by autism. I had a wonderful letter from a mother a couple of months ago, uh, she's an autistic child, and she said that her, her son had been off sugar for about three months, and she was thanking me and... Uh, her son was thinking, he was learning, he was far well better behaved, and all that had happened was he'd had sugar taken out of his diet. I'm not saying that autism is caused by sugar and fructose, OK? I'm just saying it's a contributing factor. What happens if you give kids sugar at a party? OK? They go tropo, OK? What do they like a few hours later? Yeah, dull, you know, flat, angry, cranky. All right, highs and lows. They don't concentrate well at school. Did you know that school curriculums have changed in the last 20 years? You learn the core subjects before morning tea. You learn a little bit less between morning tea and lunch, and then it's pretty well free time in the afternoons. These kids either come into school on a sugar high, they're bouncing around with a sugar low in the afternoon, or they get a big sugar high with their lunch. The school curriculum's changed. That's reactive schooling. That's a reactive curriculum. It hasn't actually gone, why are the kids doing it? 
what would happen if we gave everyone three sugar three meals a day? We haven't got we have so many mood swings. Everyone's angry, anxious, depressed. Mental illness is on the increase. No question about it. Uh, this year, a major review article in the um, Medical Journal of Australia, effectively talking about diet and the cause of mental illness and diet and the management of mental illness. Attention deficit disorder. Clearly, a component of that is diet-related. Again, not causative. I'm not going to upset a whole lot of mothers and parents by saying it is the cause, but clearly our diet is implicated in it. Cognition. That's our ability to think. That's how smart we are. I actually think hunter-gatherers were smarter than us. They were in a constant alert state looking at survival, constantly aware of their surroundings, trying to find out where their next bit of food was coming from, not even to think just about going down to coals or opening the fridge door. We've done rat studies looking at cognition and memory and ability to learn, and those that are under sugar load, and particularly a fructose load, aren't as smart. And obese rats aren't as smart as starving rats. And there's some human studies now suggesting the same thing. In fact, there's some children's studies on obesity saying that children who are obese have slower nerve conduction times in their brains in comparison to children who are not obese. That's simple facts measured between auditory canals. It's there. Migraines and headaches. I've got lots of patients, lots of family, lots of friends who tell me their headaches are better since they've given up sugar. Migraines are, he- are better. And if you think about inflammation in blood vessel walls, again, and migraines associated with uh, spasm of vessels, I say to people, it costs nothing. Why don't you try it for eight weeks and see what happens? The trouble is, lots of you are doing that. Lots of other people are doing it. They're finding out it costs nothing. It's actually going to save you money. And they feel better. Their headaches go away. And uh, life's pretty good. Um, the management of epilepsy, uh, ketogenic diets, low sugar, low carbohydrate, high fat diets have been around for about 100 years. It's getting another, and so children who are very recalcitrant to management of their epilepsy with traditional or modern drugs go on ketogenic diets. So sugar's implicated there as well. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, uh, heard of carpal tunnel syndrome? Is that a new condition or an old one? Before 1940, there were 14 cases in the world literature, one four. We do 25,000 carpal tunnel releases a year in Australia. I did another paper on this a couple of years ago. It's increasing 6% per annum. Everyone said, oh, you just ignore it. We didn't look at it before. I said, well, no, actually, I do think the great describers of disease 100 years ago, 50, 70 years ago, would have picked something as classical as carpal tunnel syndrome. So as long as no one's here from Medicare, and I'll probably get dobbed in on this, but I actually looked at uric acid levels on 40 of my patients that I did carpal tunnel releases on. One quarter of them had gout that they didn't know about. Interesting. I diagnose about four or five patients a week with gout that they didn't know about. Or at least elevated uric acid levels, okay? So not quite gout, but it's sitting there. They've got higher levels than expected. Childhood obesity is on the increase. We know that. You're going to look down the streets. In China, it's six times the rate of the United States, and they've got six times the rate of childhood diabetes in comparison with the United States. They thought the United States was in trouble. China's around the corner. Some of you might have seen that program on children's obesity in, in India recently on ABC. Same problem there. As we're getting more and more obese, we're getting metabolic syndrome and all the complications of obesity. The big one is diabetes. I alluded to the economic cost of it earlier. We cannot afford to keep going down this path. Just a little note about diabetes. I think it's really badly named. Most of us know it as sugar diabetes. It's not sugar, it's a glucose handling problem and the, and the cause of that glucose is carbohydrate. And that carbohydrate's not sugar alone, it's bread, rice, pasta, cereal, potato. You can have two pieces of bread and it will spike your blood glucose level just as much as an ice cream. Okay, so it's, I'd like to think that we actually come out of, you know, in the next couple of years and say, oh, that's, oh you've got carbohydrate diabetes, not sugar diabetes. Heart attacks, strokes, all on the increase. Hypertension on the increase. We spend masses amount of drugs trying to treat this. Here's a favourite topic. This is probably how I got started on this sugar thing. All comes down to inflammation. Cancer's all related to inflammation. Those cells are rapidly turning over. They need glucose to survive. 
It is related to insulin. Insulin promotes the growth of tumours. The Inuit Eskimos did not have cancer until the introduction of Western diet. They lived on fat. They lived on that winter fuel source, that very efficient one for a long time. There was no cancer in, in New Guinea until from the introduction of KFC. Now, I'm not blaming KFC, but the timing of the introduction of Western food was there. I operate in Vanuatu every year, and in Vanuatu they have modern disease, modern cancer, and I'm talking about breast cancer, bowel cancer, prostate cancer, that they did not have 15 years ago. In the last 15 to 20 years we've introduced Western diet to them, convenient starchy foods, high sugar loads. Children's cancer is going up 3% per annum across the world. If you give people with cancer metformin, and that's the only diabetic medication in the third world, they tend to actually do a bit better than those patients who don't. So it's quite interesting. It's now you metformin as a really you know, average diabetes medication is being used in the management of cancer. And my theory is if you actually starve the tumour of glucose, it's actually probably going to do a little bit better because the body will survive on its hybrid engine on fat. We will survive on a fat energy consumption. Cancer cells won't. They need glucose. That's where we've got it over cancer. I reckon this is the next big frontier. Can I prove it yet? But I'll, no, but you know, 10 years time, I'll rave it on this other orthopedic surgeon dabbling in endocrinology. So there's a little bit of a role for a ketogenic diet. I'm not saying that if any of you got cancer to go and do it, but start thinking about it, have a chat to your doctors. Arthritis is on the increase. Osteoarthritis on the knee is just exploding. Um, I am the first orthopaedic surgeon in Australia to not operate on patients to do joint replacement if their BMI is more than 35. I had to justify that to 130 knee surgeons at a recent meeting in Queensland and um, essentially told 130 of my colleagues that they were negligent. And uh, that went down really well. <laughs> um, but uh, I've been invited to give the paper again. So I alluded to gout before. There's been a doubling of the incidence of gout in the last 10 years despite us drinking less alcohol, eating less red meat, the traditional thoughts behind it. Autoimmune disease, celiac disease. Oh, everyone's got celiac disease now, haven't they? Well, it wasn't, you know, this is just increasing. And I don't believe it's related to the fact that we've got, we've been missing the diagnosis in the past and we're getting smarter. I think we've got more inflammation in our guts. Thyroid disease is on the increase. Type 1 diabetes, both for children and adults, is increasing. Every kid's allergic to anything. I wanted to have nuts out tonight. Can't have them. You know? Everyone's allergic. Skin allergies, gluten allergies. Um, it's all just increasing. Skin conditions, acne. I was a pimply kid. Gosh, I had a lot of sugar and carbohydrate. And now I think I probably didn't need to spend all that money on pimple cream. Um, but luckily I got rid of a few pimples before I met Belinda, so she sort of stuck with me. Acne was not present in Eskimos or New Guinea Islanders until the introduction of Western food. Food for thought, isn't it? Irritable bowel syndrome, okay, very common. I chat to the, uh, I chat to the gastroenterologist about it, and they say, oh yeah, that's uh, half of those are fructose related. Well, I said, why didn't you tell me? I'm not kidding, I said, well, you know, how come you're not telling me that uh, it's all fructose related? I said, oh, we're too busy. No, I'm not kidding, this is... I won't mention their names. Uh, so irritable bowel syndrome, very common. You just get rid of fruit, sugar, cut it way back, see what happens. You know, you'll make your own mind up after eight weeks. Now this is one because I'm a sensitive guy. I've had women tell me that they actually stop sugar for about a week before their periods are due and their period pain's better. Um, without getting too personal, I know a few women who have done it and uh, life's a lot better for them and for their fathers. <laughs> She's up the back there and I'll get knifed later. <laughs> All I say is, look, I don't care, you know, just try it, see what happens. There's an increasing rate of infection in the world. Joint replacement is getting more difficult with more and more multi-resistant organisms. I, can, I, can, I know that quite clearly. A lot of my practice is diabetic feet, as it turns out. Nobody else wanted to take it on in northern Tasmania. I'm the guy who chops off feet, chops off bits of pieces. And that's why I get angry when I keep seeing more and more patients requiring my care. I used to see a nasty case of diabetic foot thing called a Charcot feet. I used to see one or two a year. Okay, I get a new one every month now. 
and uh, become really good friends because I see those people two or three times a week for six or 12 months and a significant number, they have their legs taken off. Multi-resistant organisms are coming. They've been, uh, antibiotics are being used significant amounts in Asia uh, and particularly in uh, chicken and egg production and with that are coming uh, new organisms. Do you know how many new antibiotics are in the pipeline in the world to fight new resistant organisms? Uh, you know, everyone's, you know, there's all new drugs in the pipeline. Zero. Okay. There's no new drug out there. There's a bit of work with silver, silver nitrate, adding it to antibiotics, but there's no new antibiotics coming. So the, the, the bugs are not this. It's not a scare campaign, but yes, it is. <laughs> Polycystic ovary, ovarian disease, very common. Major root cause of infertility in women today. Well and truly associated with obesity and diabetes. Impotence is on the increase. Uh, it's thought to be related to arterial insufficiency. Uh, kidney disease is on the increase. There's more and more patients requiring dialysis, combination of inflammation, hyperuricemia, that uric acid comes back again. Liver disease is on the increase. Cirrhosis of the liver is back uh, on the news. Not, it's now called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The radiologists tell me it's a normal finding now. 30-40% of CAT scans of the abdomen have got fatty infiltration in their livers. 10% of eight-year-olds in the United States have been documented with fatty liver infiltration. 10% of eight-year-olds. I'm using uh, this concept in pain management. Oh, patients come along with vague pain, I can't work it out, they can't work it out, so look, let's just give this a go. Um, a few GPs are saying, don't go and see Fetke, he'll just tell you to give up sugar. <laughs> And then the patients come back to me saying, look, I was told not to come and see you, but I'm here and I've given up sugar and I feel better. I go, okay. I had one patient, uh, chronic pain, known him for years. And I said to him, why don't you give up sugar? And he said, I, his wife said, he doesn't eat sugar. And he said, I don't eat sugar. And I said, do you have much fruit? And he says, oh, I have a tray every day. I go, a tray? He said, yeah, I have a tray. I said, well, don't just give it up for a couple of months and see what happens. So he came back about eight weeks later and he said, I'm still in pain. And his wife said, shut up, you've lost half your pain, you're taking half your medication. Now, that's purely anecdotal. Can I write that up in a uh, medical journal? You'll get laughed out. But the trouble is, because I've been blogging now, which is the strangest phenomenon known to mankind, known to me kind, and, um, and walking around hospitals, walking around the street, I get 20 people a day now telling me their little stories, asking me queries. And that's too good an evidence to not recommend something that costs nothing and that has no side effects. Not that I can work out. <laughs> Dental disease, children's caries, well and truly on the increase. The dentists have been forever telling us to not actually have too much sugar. The list goes on and on and on and on. The health problems are out there. You name an organ, it's getting worse. Modern disease is related to inflammation. That inflammation is in every arterial wall in every organ of the body. I think it is a combination of fructose, polyunsaturated oils and refined carbohydrates. I think it's time to start putting out that inflammation at the beginning, not trying to do it at the end. I think we can reverse modern disease. That's a big call, isn't it? I think it's probably too late for me. I think I'm stuffed. It might be too late for my children. It's not too late for my grandchildren. And I advised my elder daughter and my daughter-in-law to be, um, who are both getting married next year, that I want them off polyunsaturated oils now because it takes four years to clear out that polyunsaturated oil out of the system. I'd rather they be pregnant with minimal amounts of omega-6 fatty acids in them. And I think they're listening to me, okay? Well, I can only hope. My son's not, still found a, job of, a tub of margarine in his uh, fridge, but I'm working on him. Trouble is I don't have much control over him because I'm not funding him anymore. <laughs> so I think we still need to go back in time. We need to go back to a simpler way of eating that got us to the top of the food chain over a two and a half million, dollar, uh, two and a half million year time frame. I'd like to think that you can start making some informed choices. There are some right decisions to be made there, but it's in a whole menagerie of misinformation. 
maybe the misinformation I'm giving you is misinformation. But I've stuck my head out just a little way as an orthopaedic surgeon in Australia. And as time goes on, I'm actually quite proud to be known as one of the most vocal people in Australia on this topic. I think there are right decisions to be made. They're working for me, they're working for others. It's worth thinking about. And to listen to Mark Twain, or at least quote from Mark Twain, <laughs> be very careful about reading health guidelines, to paraphrase. You may just very well die of a misprint.